certificate. And without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome our presenter today. Dr. Tiana Rogers is Director of Data, Policy, and Performance Innovation at Sorensen Impact Center, a socially conscious think tank located within the University of Utah's Akul's School of Business. She leads a variety of portfolios using data to inform government and not-for-profit entities with capacity building in various areas. Her career has focused on conducting research and serving as a field expert in the areas of homelessness, child welfare and maltreatment, public health and policy, and racial disparities. In addition to being published and with teaching experience, Dr. Rogers also consults with national and international social service organizations on program evaluation and development. She also let us know there was recently a second paper published, so make sure you ch check back to our website and we'll post links to both papers on there following the webinar. Thank you so much for being here today. We're really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Michelle. I really appreciate it. Happy to be here. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. I'm going to be sharing um, a little bit about a paper between uh, myself uh, to uh, actually myself and my colleague, um, Elizabeth and Van Webb, and we are at the Sorensen Impact Center, which is located at the University of Utah, uh, David Eccles School of Business, and we partnered with the University of Utah's medical um, school's uh, public health department to um, present this research to you today. And so I first want to um, start with just some acknowledgments and some disclosures around um, how this work has been funded and who is who has supported this work. And so um, it's really important for us to uh, acknowledge those every time we're able to uh, present and share our findings and our research with the community. So this is our game plan for today. Uh, we are going to go over a little bit around um, or detail a little bit around the theory of our work, which we use the weather and hypothesis to really provide some context or a framework for understanding um, racial disparities or health disparities in COVID-19 um, deaths. We are going to look at some of those uh, factors that contribute to some of these inequities in health and, and health outcomes related to the virus. Um, we're going to discuss a little bit why the uh, COVID mortality was higher among non-Hispanic Blacks as compared to non-Hispanic Whites. And then at the end, I'm going to share a little bit about the policy and data implications of this work and um, how this is really important in informing um, recovery and sustainability efforts following the pandemic. And so I first wanna start with just level setting and just really giving um, this work context by, by grounding it in the problem, okay? And so where we are now, um, these are numbers that I actually pulled this morning. Um, and so the World Health Organization is reporting that we're seeing almost 154 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 with 3.2 million deaths um, to date. And so with that, um, the U.S. has pretty much since the beginning of the pandemic um, been trending upwards and uh, for a time and currently is, is considered the epicenter of the pandemic with almost 570,000 um, people dying. And so when we, when we look at these numbers, I, I really want you all to take a moment to pause and consider that these are not just numbers, these are lives, these are individuals, these are families um, who have been impacted by um, the COVID-19 death. And so as, as the death rates continue to climb and, and when we were doing this research, which was spring of 2020, so it was March and April of 2020, uh, we, were, we were recognizing that there were lots of um, headlines that were talking about death, disparities and how black and brown communities were suffering in disproportionate rates and what was happening. You know, were people not being compliant? Um, were people um, making choices, you know, that, that would cause um, for some of these unlikely outcomes. And so we felt like, okay, we need to get a better understanding of this. And in order to do that, we need to have data. We need to have um, a data-driven understanding or a, a data-driven um, insight into what is happening and what are some of the contributing factors. 
And so when we talk about the problem, what we started to realize uh, when we were doing this initial inquiry was that although many of the states were implementing stay-at-home orders um, in an attempt to get ahead of this you know, rapidly spreading pandemic, uh, many of many individuals who were um, employed by what were considered essential businesses or individuals who held essential worker positions did not have the ability to stay at home. And so we pulled some of the data around that to see, you know, where was that falling? And so what we found here in these numbers is that overall, in general, approximately 20% non-Hispanic Blacks and 16% of Hispanic workers were reporting being able to work from home versus 30% of their non-Hispanic white um, counterparts being able to work from home. And so I wanna frame this um, and, and this begs the question of, you know, why is this important? And this is important because COVID-19 has really emphasized the importance of data and being able to show that Black Americans have or were experiencing and have continued to experience um, disproportionate impacts of this pandemic. And they were having, at the time of this uh, research, we were seeing that they were having higher death rates in, in states specifically, um, such as Louisiana, um, in cities like Chicago, um, Washington, D.C., um, the state of Michigan was also another really high um, death rate as it pertains to black and brown individuals. And so uh, what, we, what we started to see and we're starting to see in the trends is that uh, the global pandemic was really exposing some of the systemic problems that we were mindful of and aware of, um, but it really kind of brought them to the surface and allowed or invited an opportunity for us to fix it and to respond in a way that was meaningful. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, all of our work is really framed around theory. And so we employed the weathering hypothesis to do this inquiry. And this hypothesis really just talks about how an individual um, can be impacted or is impacted um, in their health, in their bodies physically by having social and economic disadvantages. And so we see this play out in racial disparities um, and in a variety of different health outcomes. And so we, our team employed this theory to just give us a better framing, a better understanding of how do we, how do we um, talk about this? How do we talk about these um, outcomes that we're seeing that are disproportionately impacting communities of color? And so when we put this uh, theory in, in context, um, this phenomenon really manifests in real ways. And we see it when we see higher rates of chronic medical conditions, such as asthma, high blood pressure, uh, pulmonary diseases, heart disease, um, diabetes. And so these conditions are showing up among people of color um, at, at significantly higher rates than compared to their non-Hispanic um, white counterparts. And so the disproportionate health effects of the pandemic, uh, what we were seeing were consistent with what we know historically to be true, that these chronic medical conditions among communities of color are, are not a, a result of individual or community deficits, but they are, are linked to historical and systematic and structural inequalities that are causing these communities to suffer. So all of that leads us to um, our purpose. And so when we were employing on this, on this work and deciding you know, how we were going to go about this, we decided that we wanted to investigate the racial disparities in COVID-19 mortality among essential workers in the US because we wanted to get a better understanding and we wanted to uh, frame this um, I would say frame the headlines, you know, that were saying, you know, black folks or Hispanic communities are um, not social distancing. They're not, you know, wearing masks. They're they're doing these things to, you know, put themselves at higher risk. And so we we felt that that was not true, and that there had to be something 
more happening, right? And so our central hypothesis for this work um, was that we felt that COVID-19 death was higher among non-Hispanic Blacks compared to non-Hispanic Whites because we believed and we had the suspicion that non-Hispanic Blacks were holding more essential worker positions than their non-Hispanic White counterparts. And so this helped us to, um, this was kind of our guide in helping us answer the question of, are Black people dying from COVID at higher rates because they hold more essential worker jobs? And at the time of this research, you know, um, as I no noted previously, essential workers and essential businesses were the only um, kind of allowances while people were expected to be, um, to shelter in place. And so that takes me um, to our methods. Um, and this is really just discussing and highlighting how we went about um, this inquiry. And so we were able to capture our data which um, really was broken out by um, race and ethnicity in each US state. And then also we looked at the U U entire United States in its totality. And so we pulled information or data from the American Community Survey. And then we also pulled occupational statistic, statistical information um, broken down by race and ethnicity via um, it's another U.S. Census Bureau survey called the Current Population Survey or the CPS survey. And so we were able to tie um, those two pieces together. So we looked at the um, race proportionate per state, but then we also looked at the race proportionate per occupation. And so those two things were linked um, to run the analysis on this um, for this study. And so what we found is that um, the frequency of COVID-19 total deaths, as well as the um, counts by race and ethnicity from state departments. So we were able to have our research team contact <laughs> state health departments. Um, and some of it we found online, some of it was publicly available data, data, much of it was not. And so we had to do a little digging um, to seek out this information to figure out who's dying and at what rates. And so what we ultimately were able to capture is um, 35 states were able to share their information with us. And one thing to really remember is that this was March, April of 2020. So this was really, really like right at the beginning of the breakout in the United States of the pandemic. So there were not, um, there wasn't a lot of time, you know, for folks to really get their ducks in a row regarding data if they had not already been collecting this information. And so uh, we, 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 were, we were able to capture this information from 35 states, which was ended up being about 70%. And uh, we were able to disaggregate that out or break it down by race and ethnicity. And so the exclusions here are listed, the states that were excluded um, from our data analysis because they did not provide us with that statistical information. And so what we did is we aggregated the individual death data from all the available states, including Washington DC or the District of Columbia and then we um, were able to create an overall death prevalence from that. And what we found is that um, for states like New York, um, COVID-19 data was collected from the CDC's system due to limited availability. Um, and so this was actually a common thing that we saw happening where some states just had different systems to collect this data and some states just simply weren't sharing the information. And so these are some of the um, data measures that we used when we were conducting the analysis. And so throughout the entire study, we were able to categorize our race and ethnic groups into these five categories. And so um, we also included, co we had to define COVID-19 deaths. And so this included both confirmed and probable. And so a confirmed death was defined as that of an individual with a posit positive COVID-19 laboratory test. And then a probable death was defined as somebody who um, was without a known positive COVID test, 
but whose death certificate gave them the cause of death as COVID-19. And so individuals who um, before death displayed symptoms or characteristics of COVID-19 um, were actually counted as COVID-19 deaths using clinical judgment. And so with defining um, you know, COVID-19 mortality or COVID-19 death, uh, we were able to compare those numbers across occupations. And we were, we were able to look at a total of 22 um, populations which were detailed in the current population survey. And uh, with the exception of the armed forces, just because that was a really limited sample size. And so this is the list of the um, survey occupations. So this is kind of how they break it out and how they categorize various essential worker um, occupations. Okay, so for our statistical analysis, when we ran the analysis of, after we pulled the data from you know, each state looking at the death rates and then each state looking at the occupational rates, again, by race and ethnicity, um, we were able to use the CPS data and weigh um, the prevalence of each occupation among each racial group. So we looked at the differences between non-Hispanic whites in a specific job function as an essential worker classification. And then we looked at the uh, number of non-Hispanic blacks for each occupation as well. And then we did that cross comparison of that. And then we divided the percentage of non-Hispanic black COVID-19 deaths by the percentage of non-Hispanic black population in each state. And so, as well as um, in DC. And so what that helped us do was to um, be able to paint the picture of, you know, um, compared to their representation in the larger population, that is how we were able to show that they were dying at disproportionate rates. Uh, because for instance, in, in I think it was um, states like Wisconsin, you know, black folks were representing a very small percentage of that population, but they were making up a significant portion of the deaths. And so we ultimately used Spear Spearman rank order correlation to examine that correlation between the prevalence of COVID-19 deaths, as well as the prevalence of each occupation across racial groups, as well as across states. And so all statistical analysis was conduct conducted using SAS 9.4, um, at a significance level of 0 0.05. So this is where it gets good. This is what we found. So ultimately what we uncovered in our inquiry was that among the combined states, the prevalence of non-Hispanic deaths from COVID-19, which is about 21%, was disproportionately higher than non-Hispanic Blacks unweighted US population, meaning that Black people only make up about 13, 12% of the US population. However, when we talk about COVID deaths, they were making up 21% of that population. And so um, the CPS data, the, the population survey data really revealed that compared to non-Hispanic whites, non-Hispanic black, blacks were actually more likely to work in jobs that were considered essential during the COVID-19 pandemic. And among all of the 35 states, as well as um, the District of Columbia, the, the five occupations that had the highest disparities in this proportion were transportation, healthcare support, food preparation, uh, building and ground cleaning and maintenance, personal care and service. So those are things like PCA or CNAs. And one thing to really be clear about is that this trend was seen across 26 states. Um, with the, the largest discrepancy being seen um, between death and population representation in states um, like Wisconsin and Kansas. So, um, oh, I have the exact numbers here. So um, in particular, um, I was mentioning Wisconsin previously. And so in Wisconsin, you have non-Hispanic Blacks being comprised of 6.17% um, of the population. However, they made up 36.49% of the state's deaths. 
And so this really shows up in a variety of um, occupations. And so for of note, um, you know, the top two here are transportation, material moving. Um, you can see here that Blacks are represented in that um, position at almost 11%, where we have whites at about five and a half percent. Um, and the same is true with healthcare support. Blacks are making up about five and a half percent, whereas whites are barely at 2%. So all occupational categories were significant or significantly positively correlated with the percentage of COVID deaths. So um, for example, we um, used Spearman correlation coefficient um, and it ranged at a minimum of 0.52 in farming, fishing and forestry occupations. And it ranged all the way up to a maximum of 0.9 in protective service occupations. And so some other occupations that um, were not highlighted in the chart, but that are in the paper as well, that have some strong co correlations to COVID-19 deaths include essential worker positions such as healthcare support, um, as well as I noted previously, the transportation and material uh, moving, they um, had a correlation of 0.87. So some of the reflections um, of this work that are, are important to consider as, as you think about the results and the outcomes of our inquiry really um, point to a variety of things. So one thing is that, you know, disparities among when you're comparing non-Hispanic Blacks to non-Hispanic Whites, um, the death rates for this pandemic and at the time of this inquiry were not only high in COVID hotspots, they were actually high almost everywhere across the United States. And although our findings showed um, state-specific occupational differences in states, um, that had denser, maybe, um, you know, um, larger representations of non-Hispanic Blacks, they consistently showed that disparity. Non-Hispanic Black essential workers living in high density housing also may be unable to practice social distancing at home, rendering those that live with disproportionately vulnerable to the COVID exposure. So for example, if you have a, um, you know, young, say a young teenager who's working and there's a multi-generational family and they're trying to help support their family, they're going out to work at Target or Walmart and they are risking themselves by being exposed. Um, they have a much greater chance of bringing that back if they don't live in housing that would allow them to socially distance or um, if they don't have the option to work from home and, and modify um, those components of their career. So those are some of the things that we really want to consider. And lastly, on this point is um, many of the non-Hispanic Blacks are residing in the Midwest, specifically Wisconsin, Kansas, Missouri, Michigan, Illinois. So kind of like that Mississippi River kind of area. Um, were actually the hardest hit by COVID-19 with their mortality rates ranging from nearly three to six times higher than those of, of non-Hispanic whites. And while many Midwestern cities um, are often designated among the best places to live in America, you know, when you see these different rankings that come out each year for non-Hispanic Blacks, they are actually among some of the worst places for them to call home due to well-documented racial disparities that exist in education and employment, incarceration, income, um, home ownership, redlining, uh, medical care, voting access. Um, there are just a variety of social economic factors that impact um, these communities' abilities to thrive. And to continue on with the, the conversation around just reflections, right? And we talk about black and brown communities. Um, the central moral dilemma of COVID-19 is that um, there, there was this concept when we did our paper around like restarting America and you know, saving the economy. And 
we, we were very clear with the fact that COVID-19 did not discriminate, but we also recognize that the truth can, that could also um, not be said about the healthcare system. And so the level of which um, individuals were able to receive care and access care and the quality of care in which they were able to obtain greatly impacted their ability to recover from or survive the pandemic. And so the racial disparities among essential workers, what we ultimately discovered and, and point out in our paper is that it really is just a byproduct of um, where we are as a country, right? Like the bottom line is that these disparities are not about personal or communal deficits, but rather about longstanding systemic racism and structural inequalities that are combined with a lack of public policy that is aimed to protect those who are putting their lives at risk every day to protect the rest of us. And so, so those are some of the things that we have to, we have to consider and be, and be mindful of as we move forward with equitable recovery, we, when we talk about where we want those resources to go and how to best use them. And last, but certainly not least, we need data. And we need data that is um, transparent. We need data that is disaggregated or broken down by race and ethnicity so that we can actually make evidence-based decisions that are rooted in objectivity around who is impacted the worst so that we can respond and shift resources um, in a timely way uh, that would allow for more equitable and evidence-based responses um, to this global pandemic. And it will also help guide recovery efforts as, as we move forward. And so there's, it's really difficult to have an accurate picture of which communities are hit the hardest if we don't have the data, the objective data to really know um, where it's happening and who's being impacted the most and where we need to um, shift our attention and our resources. So if you'd like to learn more about this, um, as Michelle mentioned earlier, um, they will be sharing the link to this paper, um, as well as our follow-up paper to this. My colleagues and I did a second paper where we talked about um, the comorbidity. Um, so basically what happened after this paper and our, ours was the first of this type, there were many more papers that came after. And so the argument kept being, well, um, black and brown folks are dying because they already have pre-existing conditions. Um, they already have diabetes. They already have high blood pressure. They already have these things that um, put them at a higher risk of dying from COVID. So if they get COVID, then you know that's just why they're dying. And so our paper really refutes that argument and really points out, pulls some data and points out that um, black, um, Hispanic, Native American individuals actually have less comorbidities than their non-Hispanic white counterparts. And so um, it, it's really powerful and that, that paper really highlights um, the level of care. So it talks about, you know, going on ventilation and what that, what are the implications of that as well as the type of insurance, whether it's public or private and, and what are some of the implications of that. So there is more to come <laughs> if you're interested in, in looking into that or learning more about that. Thank you so much for your presentation and for sharing your research with us. Yes. As I've mentioned before and we'll mention again, we're so incredibly grateful to have you here with us. Um, and at this time, if for our attendees, you are welcome to enter your questions into the online Q&A box. And we ask that you enter the questions there. It helps us keep better track of them so they don't get lost in the chat box. Um, and we do have some questions coming in. Um, one of my questions was actually if you could share a little bit more about your recent publication, but you did already, so thank you so much. Um, and we'll be sure to post the links to both your, your uh, both publications on the website and include in addition to the, the uh, recording of the webinar. Um, one of our first questions, um, race, and I'll also add racism, has been widely accepted as a social determinant of health. And um, how do you see your study fortifying 
the information or the existing research in this topic area? Yeah, I, I, I think I'm, and I'm probably biased because it's my work, <laughs> but I, I think, I think that we, that our study fortifies this argument in a very objective way. Um, we really just simply pulled the data and ran the analysis and shared out what we found. And of course, we gave more context in the discussion of it around what are the implications and what are some of those food for thought points. Um, but I think, Michelle, to your point, that it's very important for us to distinguish that it's racism and not race that impacts um, social determinants of health. And so you're not um, disadvantaged just because you are uh, black or brown, we are disadvantaged because there are systems in place that don't allow for the same privileges and opportunities. Thank you. And, and also a, another question kind of following in that thread, and how do you envision your work and the studies that you're working on furthering public policy on prioritizing public health systems in both the short and the long term? What are you encouraged to see and what are some things that you would like to see changed or redirected? I'm, in, I'm encouraged to see the conversations around equitable recovery and what that looks like. Um, however, I'm concerned that we have had previous global pandemics that showed us where we erred. And I'm concerned that if we do not take a look at those serious, so for example, the HIV pandemic, there's so much research that shows that black and brown communities were left behind. Um, when we, when there was significant movement in that, in that space, you know, and so I think what I would like to see and, and what I would hope to see is that we are taking lessons from history, um, as well as, as looking at those who are doing this work currently and taking, um, their expertise seriously, um, and not just saying that we want to do something, but actually putting the resources behind doing this because we all know I work in a business school it takes resource it takes capital um, and that is one of the things that I'm hoping that our ability to really just say we need this data so that we know where the capital needs to shift where do we put the money basically you know like we need to know where where it can go so that it is most impactful and it and it is an equitable response, meaning that not everybody gets the same thing, but everybody gets what they need. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, another question, how did you define healthcare support in your study? So we didn't necessarily define the essential worker positions, the CPS or the US, um, the US Census Bureau defines those roles. Um, we just specifically, use the categories for which they classified those. So I, I, because there were 22, I don't recall exactly what that um, full definition, but there is definitely more detail about it in the paper. Great, thank you. And that actually also answered another follow-up question is how essential occupations were defined. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can you provide a little bit more insight on what the weathering hypothesis is for those unfamiliar? Yeah, so the weathering hypothesis really just speaks to, it's really a framework to think about um, when we talk about even the, the field of public health and health disparities, um, health disparities research, where we talk about, you know, why are these communities experiencing these disproportionate um, health outcomes, right? And not even just health outcomes, social outcomes, social economic outcomes. And the weather and hypothesis really provides a context that really says uh, there's this belief that if you are a part of this underrepresented community, because there are these systematic and structural um, inequalities that are built in, you, you are suffering basically um, unfairly, I guess, um, to put it nicely, um, and you are disproportionately advantaged um, when it comes to even things like having decent health, um, having, you know, parks that have trees that allow you to have higher quality oxygen, right? So these are all things that 
we don't always think about when we talk about health outcomes. It's often like, oh, well, this community or that community has a higher rate of this or that, and we're seeing more deaths in this community, but we're not considering the, um, the entire ecosystem and how it is structured and how it impacts and how those things kind of um, interact with one another and impact one another. Thank you so much for that context, very helpful. Um, another question, um, in regard to high density living situations, does your data indicate mortality rates of anyone who lived in a situation where COVID-19 was transmitted via the high density living situation or just people who were working in high risk occupations? Were you able to, I guess, uh, separate those at all in your data? Yeah, so we actually did not look at housing status of the essential workers. That point was really just in our discussion around some of the things that we really want to consider when we talk about people who have essential worker or who are holding essential worker positions or people who are maybe business owners that own essential businesses that are allowed to be open. You know, how do we consider what their other the other facets of their life, you know, could it be, we know, you know, just from general data, we know that there are more uh, multi-generational families happening again, you know, that is starting to be another growing trend in communities and, and particularly in communities of, of color. And so when we, when we think about that in, in its proper context, that is, that is kind of the position we were holding is, you know, we're looking at these positions. However, we still need to consider that there may be these other factors that are, it's, it's like a snowball effect, you know, where they're going, they're going back to families that may be vulnerable. Yeah, thank you so much. Very important, thanks. Yeah. Um, in the case of Hispanic workers, did you find that migratory status attributed to disparity at all? Or is that anything that you looked at? That was not looked at in this in this research. Thank you. Um, have your findings been used to direct any changes in terms of protective measures for the essential worker jobs to prevent COVID transmission? You know, it's always hard to know that. <laughs> I would I would hope so. I would really really hope so because. Uh, we have had people reach out to us and have asked, you know, what are some of the recommendations? Um, and some of the things in the, in the very beginning, I can remember doing an interview and there was um, discussion around like some of the stores who were requiring masks and some of the stores who weren't. And it, it was like this, this thought of like, why is that even optional? You know, like if people are risking their lives to make sure that you can go grocery shopping and get food and stay home, uh, why is it an argument that, that you would be asked to protect yourself and protect the people that are serving you? Um, and, it, and it was just really, um, I think the point of like, you know, those who are sacrificing the most are the least protected. And I think that's a common thread in our society. Yeah, and I, I'd also, uh, excuse me, i like to add for this questioner, um, I will say that in California, um, some different data that has come out has also helped with the passing of the California OSHA Emergency Temporary Standard on COVID-19 prevention. Um, and so that is a standard that was explicitly drawn to COVID-19 because although these protections theoretically are required, um, data was showing us that they weren't being implemented and workers were still getting sick and injured. Um, and so very specific regulations were crafted for COVID-19 prevention um, that all employers are now required to adhere to. Um, so I just to, to validate that, yes, the data does get used. It yeah. does go places to, yeah. to protect workers. Um, awesome. Another question, uh, do hazardous jobs also contribute to weathering? You know, I don't know. That's, <laughs> that's, that's a little outside of, of what I've thought about so far, but um, I, I don't know. I would be interested to, to, to look into that actually though. Definitely. Great, thank you. Yeah. And um, can you also expand on why there was a limited sample size for the armed services? Um, was it because the supply of data to the study was limited? The proportion yes. of racial minorities in the military is larger than the general population. Yes. So we were curious what, what limited that data set. Yes, it was because of the just the limited supply of information. 
Um, and, and as I mentioned before, you know, we were starting this inquiry maybe late March of 2020. And so here we are in Salt Lake, we had just shut down maybe two weeks before that, you know, so, so it was still very early as well for us to be requesting this information. And so we were really, um, we were submitting this research to a special edition journal. And so there was a tight turnaround to get the inquiry in. And so we, we tried to capture as much as we could get um, you know, during that window of time, and we vowed that we would go back and, and look at, you know, where we, where we maybe didn't um, get all of the data. So, yeah, that's definitely the reason. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, and another point, too, that I, I wanted to point out to everyone who's listening today, um, the National, uh, NIOSH, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, um, also has a unit um, specifically devoted to occupational health equity. I'm in recognition that not all workers have the same risk of experiencing work-related health problems, even when they have the same job, and starting to look at some of these other factors in work-related disease incidents, mental illness, morbidity, mortality, and how these factors are linked with social, economic, environmental disadvantages at work. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, there are resources also available through NIOSH, um, specifically looking at that occupational health equity question. Um, and so with that, pointing out NIOSH and, and occupational health equity, I'm curious if uh, the, this idea of occupational health equity at all contributed to some of your work or how, how some of those themes might have been informed by what it is that you've done. Yeah, I think, I think that we've, that all of that was taken into context. I think because we have such a diverse team, we had such a diverse team. We had biostatisticians, we had data scientists, we had policy experts, we, have, we had two public health um, experts. And so I think everyone was kind of presenting their own kind of lens and, and lending their own expertise to their field to this work. Um, and so, yeah, we definitely were, were considering the fact that these inequities exist and some industries are just starting to kind of hit the tip of the iceberg and exploring how it, it's showing up in the workplace. Yeah, thank you. And I know um, UC Berkeley also did a study looking at the COVID infection rates among um, a lot of the farm working populations mm -hmm. um, and the disproportionate impact that it had on Latinx workers in California. So that is another resource Incredible. for those listening in if you wanted to see the research done out of the, the UC Berkeley School of Public Health, um, specifically addressing that as well. It's a part of um, the group who we have something called the Chacomo study that looks at pesticide exposure in children over a long cohort mm -hmm. of time. And so they were, uh, the group was very tied into the Salinas Valley community and were able to build on that research and look at the the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 infection among this, this group of vulnerable farm workers. Um, so more resources, plenty, everyone can go home and do some homework and <laughs> looking at additional yeah. resources and learning more about this truly essential topic. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So we have some more questions coming in. Okay. Um, have you found that selecting the a status of race to be confusing for the Latino, Latinx, Hispanic community, often when asked, what is your race and ethnicity, I find my patients find it's not as clear what to choose. I don't specifically um, work in the medical setting to ask those type of uh, questions in surveys that I have run before. I, I do think that sometimes there is a confusion around that. And, and they're actually, I have a few colleagues who are actually looking at um, conducting an equitable demographics study where they are actually looking at that and considering what should the categories be? How, like, how can we make it more inclusive, more intuitive to everybody that's looking at those options? So that, that is really something that I'm not as familiar with, but I do think, and I do know that there is interest around that in helping to address that for sure. Thank you. I would also be very interested to see that research when it comes out yeah. and for sharing. <laughs> yeah. Um, from an intervention standpoint, in terms of the lens of supporting communities, what are your thoughts on some either quick wins, low investment, high impact that may help build momentum, or is, are these really structural things that 
you know, long-term impact? Is there any quick wins to help improve health outcomes? Man, <laughs> it's so like it's so layered. Um, I, I think I think some of the quick wins are really um, recognizing, especially in healthcare that uh, we are here to serve the people. And I think that many times we create these systems and these um, loopholes that make it difficult for folks to navigate. I've, I was reading an article the other day just regarding even getting COVID vaccines and how it, you know, many of them are uh, require you to have internet access. They require you to, you know, navigate this digital form and things that that are sometimes difficult for people to navigate. And also under the assumption that everybody has um, access to internet. And so I, I think that taking the resources to where the people are is essential. Um, and I think that that's an easy thing to do. I think it's just a matter of wanting to do it or not. Um, so to me, those are easy. Those are, I mean, those are no brainers. Those are quick wins. Those are, are things that um, would, would allow for a more inclusive recovery as far as even giving people access to get the vaccine if that's something that they choose. Thank you. That's also a really, really important point. Um, I know I've been in, in conversations with people also thinking about concepts like COVID or vaccination passports and things like that. And that also assumes a level of access. Um, and, and how do you logistically manage that for people who don't have a smartphone to carry around their COVID-19 passport, whether or not they are exempt, et cetera. Um, so that is definitely a huge issue. Thank you for bringing that up. And we do have time for a few more questions. Again, you're able to enter your questions into the online Q&A chat box there. Um, another question, do you think that human-centered design could aid in decreasing inequalities? Oh, whoever asked that has my heart. <laughs> human-centered design is, is, I use it in almost everything I do. Um, I, I, I do believe, you know, <clears throat> having worked for um, Department of Health and Human Services prior to coming to the University of Utah, I used to always say, we can't forget, um, we don't want to lose the human in human service. And we don't want to forget that there are people, you know, like I mentioned with the COVID deaths, there are people attached to this, there are families, there are stories um, that are attached to this. And <clears throat> I think using a hum human-centered design is actually brilliant because it operates under the belief that the people closest to the problem have the solution. And if we wholeheartedly believe that, then it is only our job to help remove the barriers that prevent these communities and individuals from, from accessing the level of, of um, life and the level of health that they deserve. Um, and so, yes, I, I absolutely think that human-centered design is, is, I think it's an amazing approach and <laughs> it's one of my favorites. <laughs> so yeah, definitely. Thank you. And I have another question. It's, it's less tied, I guess, as immediately to your research, but I think your research also points out a lot of ties into this area. It's just thinking about um, the way that privilege, equity, position, all of these things might weigh into workers' sense of self-empowerment and protecting themselves and requesting, you know, I think of restaurant workers who have reported like, oh, take off your mask and give me a smile for a good tip and those kinds of requests yeah. that people in these fields are getting from customers as they're in engaging, you know, work-related violence of yes. asking somebody to please adhere to the guidance that is published. Um, I, I guess, do you have any insight or things that you would like to share kind of tied to that topic in terms of how that might also weigh into to what it is you've been exploring? You know, Michelle, <laughs> I, 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 it's, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, we can do all of the research and we can pull all of the data that we want, right? But we can't force human beings to be better human beings to each other. And so I, I really, you know, feel like, yes, this is um, 
yes, we are um, addressing the systemic level and we're addressing kind of those systematic things. However, there's also a huge component um, that requires the individual and that requires folks to really get clear about how they are showing up in community, how they are coexisting with others and uh, getting clear that there are those within their same community that may be having a very different experience than they are. And that's something that you can't train. You know, I get a lot of people asking me, you know, well, what training would you recommend? It's hard to train kindness. You know, it's, <laughs> that's not, you know, that's the, as me as a researcher, I don't believe that that's reasonable. Um, and, and I'm not really interested in that because I, I think that you have to put the onus on the individuals as well. Yes, there are systematic things and we are speaking to those things as far as policy and data and what is needed, but there are also these individual components that, that weigh heavy um, you know, on those things. And it, and it requires for us to be honest with ourselves and for us to des decide who do we wanna be and how do we wanna show up? Yeah, thank you. That is such an important point. Yeah, you cannot teach kindness. So it's up to all of us to decide how we show up every day. Thank you. Yeah. And we have another question following up on your 30 plus data or your 30 state data set. Um, and they noted that some of the states, West Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee, um, non-Hispanic white essential workers uh, might have also been working in these areas and how, um, how you might have been able to show reverse how you might have been able to show COVID outcomes um, in comparison to the, the white essential workers in some of those states. Um, I'm, if you think that okay. that might have changed your data set at all. I'm, I'm okay. Um, can you, can you repeat it for me? Yes. I'm, I'm trying to try. <laughs> Thank you to the person who asked it. I'm, I'm uh, also struggling a little bit. So if you have <laughs> any clarifying questions, please do free to follow up. Okay. Um, they noted that West Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee, there might have been also more white essential workers in those states. Okay. Um, or white and non-Hispanic non essential workers in those states. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's other systemic disadvantages that could have also led to COVID outcomes, um, not just among black essential workers, but also white essential workers in some of those other areas that you didn't have data for. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that anything is possible, right? Like we don't know unless we have the data. Um, but I think that that is a super valid point that when we talk about, um, race and class, you know, how those things intersect. It is really difficult sometimes to, to parse those things out and to, to lend the reasoning to one thing solely. But I do think that, that we definitely um, are thinking about and have to consider the socioeconomic status of people as well. And, and I definitely can definitely understand what they're saying as far as those states potentially may, may have had more essential workers that were non-Hispanic white. Definitely possible, definitely possible. And I think probably, you know, I don't know what our team is gonna end up doing again, but we may, you know, do a follow-up to see if we can get those remaining states to um, share data now that we're, you know, over a year into the pandemic. Thank you, yeah. And I think this, all of these questions also just really highlight, we, we know what we know based on the data that we can get and we, we do yeah. our best to, to fill it in, but really just the ability, the availability to collect, to receive, to analyze data. We need yeah. the data, <laughs> yes. so thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, and um, another final question, do you have any advice for essential workers based on your research? Is there any, I guess, parting thoughts that you would like to share with, with folks as we wrap up our webinar today? I would say be good to yourself <laughs> and, 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 you know, really, really um, know that, that we are grateful for your sacrifice and, um, and, and we are trying to be responsible as well and, and, and own our part in helping keep you safe as well, because we recognize that you know you need to go home to your family as well, and we all we all should be um, leaving our homes with that in mind that we want to return and we don't want to return and and potentially um, bring something to those that may be vulnerable within our households. 
Um, so I would just say, yeah, just, just be good to yourself, be kind to yourself and be unapologetic about protecting yourself and, you know, wearing your mask and, you know, distancing when you can. And if you can get um, the vaccine and that's something that you want to do, reach out for resources um, because it's important that you're protected just as much as anybody else. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, someone also added, they, they feel like the kindness portion is certainly important. Um, and a lot of people might not be as aware of the systemic constructs that disadvantage certain groups of people. And are there any resources you would recommend for people to educate themselves so they can help fill in some of these educational and awareness gaps that they may have? Oh, I would say <laughs> I, I don't have resources off the top of my head, primarily because I live it every day. So I would say that there is a plethora of information, um, even Google. Um, LinkedIn, I actually have been seeing so many people share resources. Um, and I would also say, do not burden uh, BIPOC communities with that request because there is enough um, invisible labor that is happening, that is not accounted for, that um, we are not compensated for. Um, and there's not even the expectation that we would be compensated for educating other people around our lived experiences. And so I, I really think again, the onus goes back on the individual. If this is something that is important to you, um, there are resources readily available for you to access. Yeah, thank you so much for that very important point. Um, I will add to, um, again, we will post lots of resources on, on the website. Um, so please do check back to that webpage where you registered for this webinar. Um, we'll be posting both the links to the, the research articles that Dr. Rogers mentioned. Um, there are also structural competency trainings, healthcare ethics trainings, all sorts of trainings that you can get online. Um, I know at UC Berkeley, there's an entire list of resources for those who want to practice anti-racism and looking at exploring how racism is a social determinant of health and educating themselves, increasing awareness on those topics. So I'll put lots of links in, in our webinar follow-up page for people who, who would like to do their homework and, and dig into this a little bit more. Um, Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Rogers. Thank we really, you. really appreciate your time and sharing your research. Um, and as a reminder to everybody else who joined us, the, we will send out an email tomorrow afternoon with a webinar recording and an evaluation link for everyone who's logged in with their registration emails today. Um, and be sure to check out that website for more information and to register for other upcoming events at cueh at berkeley.edu backslash about CE. And thank you all so much for your wonderful questions and participation mm -hmm. today. Thank you all. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Take care. Take care.